Hello, welcome back to our series, Behind the Scenes of Nautilus. I'm Commander Brad Boyd, Director of Submarine Force Museum and also in charge of Storkship Nautilus. This episode, we finish our control room tour with radio in the interior communication area. Once again, I talked about it last episode, uh, interior communication area isn't really, it's not the name of it, it's just part of control, but that's the equipment that's there, so to help distinguish exactly where we are, I'm calling it that to, to better lay the land. We're also going to go into number one, the navigation scope uh, well, so you can see the travel that that scope would take uh, when it goes up and down. So, But first we need to go to a clarification. So I had two questions, uh, well one question and one comment from the previous episode. The question was at what point do they set limits for uh, uh, the control surface uh, reduction and, and sensitivity. So we had talked about the helm, the stern planes, and the bow planes. Uh, all had limits so that they wouldn't do full throw when you pushed or turned full throw on the, on the control surface so that at higher speeds you don't have a drastic effect on the ship. The faster the ship goes, the more flow over the surface, the more responsive, the more lift or uh, it can cause on a stern planes or dive or turn, whichever, whichever direction we're talking about. That was something that would have been held under the procedure for Nautilus. I don't have those procedures uh, on more modern boats. For example, Los Angeles class, we just had one speed that we would shift from low speed to high speed. I'm not going to go into exactly what speed it was, but there was one speed that we would shift from normal operations to high speed operations to limit the throw of the planes to uh, keep you from uh, diving or broaching uh, extremely or turning too hard uh, based off the increased speed over the planes. So. That's that question. The other one was, I had said the 637 class was the first class that uh, had the combined station, so the helm, the bow planes, and the stern planes combined into uh, two stations, uh, stern planes and then helm and bow planes. It was actually the uh, 585 class, and really it was the, um, the Albacore, the USS Albacore, the one that uh, proved the Albacore hull shape, the teardrop uh, shape design was the USS Albacore diesel boat, and they had the control surfaces combined, and then Albacore's hull design, along with the proof of nuclear power, is a new power plant, but the proof of nuclear power from Nautilus married together to make the Skipjack class, the 585. So I apologize for misspeaking. I was thinking Skipjack class, but then said 637, uh, which is a different class, so my apologies. Didn't mean to confuse anybody. It was uh, the Skipjack class was the first full class. Albacore would have been the first ship based off of uh, her being the prototype hull design for the Skipjack class. So with that, I uh, hope you enjoyed today's tour and let's get to it. Step through the door here. Now, on the way, uh, we'll stop at this spot here. So general announcing control. Uh, so this allows you to select where the uh, 1MC, 7MC, 1MC is general, 7MC is uh, communication between usually uh, Ship's control uh, or the con uh, in the attack center back to maneuvering uh, could also be done from the bridge. It allows the officer of the deck and the ship's control party to drop directly to maneuvering who controls uh, the lights on board, electricity on board, but more importantly, control from their purposes, it controls the power of the propulsion. So that way, uh, uh, the guy who's pushing back there, uh, they can have direct communication as to what's available, what they need exactly, that type of thing. So that's that. Into radio. All right, so radio. By the way, we do have to clean on board, so we have a, a dust buster back here. That's the big secret of what's kept in radio. No, but really what's kept in radio that's the big secret is right back here. Not on board anymore, but when she was operational, that had been cryptography. Um, and that allows them to uh, secure communications. So radio, uh, Nautilus would have primarily communicated via radio waves, not via satellites through her day, although towards the end she would have had satellite communication capability. Um, but she would have been communicating on the various spectrums, so uh, probably receiving on VLF, very low frequency, and then transmitting on high frequency HF, very high frequency VHF, your typical radio bands, um, and then satellite communications when they came along with uh, extremely high frequency and uh, ultra high frequency. Um, I don't think she had super high frequency uh, capability. She may have, may not. I, I, I just don't know exactly what communication bands she had available to her but um, radio would take the information that they the message that they need to route uh, or send off they'd type it in um, and it'd either be sent off by cha changing that into uh, a signal to be transmitted via satellite or via radio so they could transmit that message off so basically it turns into electrons then gets transmitted off whichever method they need or they could also use uh, a morse code so that's what this is and transmit off that way uh, if they if they needed to uh, 
depending on what circuit they're up on and who they're communicating with and how they're communicating. Um, radio helped revolutionize the use of submarines in warfare, especially during World War II. Prior to World War II, radio was not that reliable, if there at all, um, and you would sail with orders, but that was all you had. You didn't really get updates, and you couldn't really send off your, your updates back to shore. You could try, but it didn't always work, and definitely not a great range. Radio range drastically increased for World War II. With that came cryptography. Uh, all absolutely necessary. So, you, radio, when you transmit it, goes in every direction. You can kind of, you know, fine-tune it down something of a bearing if you have shields uh, around uh, your transmitter so it can fine-tune it, but it's still, it's going to go to wherever you're going and past it, and realistically, especially on a submarine, when we transmit off, it goes in every direction. It's an omnidirectional signal. So anybody can pick it up. So the only way to keep what you're saying secret is by encrypting it. And so that was cryptography. So radio success went hand-in-hand hand with cryptography. There's lots of stories of World War II of breaking codes, either the German or the Japanese codes, and, and they're trying to break ours at the same time so that we could read what the message traffic that's going on and anticipate what's going to happen. But the radio allowed greater employment of the submarine. Now we didn't have to go back to port to get new orders. We could be on mission and receive radio traffic to go stand plane guard and prepare for a B-29, uh, or uh, name, name the bomber, but a bombing sortie that goes over and they're returned that they have engine failure or took battle damage um, and they have to ditch the plane, the submarine can be there to rescue the air crew. Um, all those things happen because radio is available. It allowed us to go prepare the battle space and report back what we saw more real time rather than go take photographs, come back, go back to Pearl, which might take weeks to get there, to then have that data analyzed as opposed to just reporting back, we see this. Uh, as we prepare uh, for the island hopping campaign of the Pacific. Also allowed us to uh, um, communicate with each other. Uh, other submarines were back to shore to coordinate uh, attacks on Japanese convoys that we saw that may have been out of range for us. So we may detect a convoy that's moving along, but it's out of our range to get to, but we can report back where it is, where it's headed. Somebody else can try to go and intercept. All that came with radio um, and 100% revolutionized the use of submarines in warfare uh, with that. So... Done with radio, and we're going to go on to interior communications. So I say it's interior communications. It's really depends on what time you're talking about. So uh, interior communications rating went away at one point. Uh, now it's just merged with navigation electronics technician. Um, so I would I would have grown up calling this in the nav ET space, but it really been interior communications is its purpose. So you've got some storage here, whatever. But really, it's over here. So this is a switchboard system that allows you to. Uh, determine what has and does not have power at various stations. So if something's got to shorten it somewhere, you can cut that out, uh, do maintenance on whatever the system needs to be done, uh, and what have you. Uh, so that's what this area is back here. Then you have CAMS, Central Atmosphere Monitoring System. So CAMS is very much an upgrade. So this would not have been launched with Nautilus. This was uh, installed uh, probably in the 70s, uh, given they probably didn't install anything uh, past about 78, given she was going to DCOM in 19, 1979 to 1980. Um, but if it looks a little bit newer, that's because it is. We did not retrofit back to original when she became a museum. But central atmosphere monitoring, what this does is it continuously monitors the atmosphere for the gases that you see here. Carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide, hydrogen, freon, um, another version of freon, depending on which refrigeration plant, air conditioning plant you're talking about. Um, nitrogen, oxygen. So we would use this continuously to let us know what the atmosphere in the ship is. Do we need to start an oxygen bleed from a from an oxygen tank or light off an oxygen candle? I'll talk about that in a future episode. Um, but all that would have been done and controlled via uh, CAMS, um, uh, the indications for it. But if we ever had a fire on board, we immediately secure CAMS because the acid produced in a fire would destroy CAMS if we operated it during it. So we secure cams and we shift to what we call our dregger tubes, which if you picture a turkey baster and then put a tube on the end of it, um, just like you're going to baste a turkey, and you draw something in, you basically draw air into that tube. Uh, that tube is designed to detect a specific gas, either be it a f acid from the fire or carbon monoxide, down carbon dioxide, oxygen, you name the, name the gas. And you can determine this uh, atmosphere sample, uh, the atmosphere based off of the color that that tube changes, and you hold it up next to a little chart and you figure out what you've got. 
once we ventilate, secure uh, the casualty, ventilate the space, got her back to where we need to be, then we'll energize cams again, and normal running would be with uh, with cams to uh, determine our atmospheres. So that's cams. All right, one other spot. So this is actually uh, beneath number one periscope, the navigation scope. So you can see this room here. This is not a normal East Man space underway. I would have been, you know, people would not have been in here. However, Directly up there and through that cover is the number one scope, which we saw a couple episodes ago when we were in the attack center. The number one scope would be Howl, so when it's down, it would come through there. That cover wouldn't be there. It's just to keep stuff from falling through, keep somebody from being stupid and stepping through it. Um, but that number one scope would come down through this, through here, and then down into here and rest right, basically right about there. This area, if you can see into it, I apologize, it's not great lighting in here, but you can see the announcing circuit there. There's a uh, hydraulic lever there. Um, so this space would not have been a manned space, but if we ever had to load or unload the mass, so you need to do repairs on the periscope, get an upgrade on the periscope, uh, what have you, uh, this space would be, somebody would be in it to uh, help guide the mast into or out of the ship. So, and then with that, <laughs> That's the interior communication area. And uh, we're done for this episode, so I will see you next episode. I uh, hope you enjoyed this tour. Um, but next episode, we'll be going into uh, Cruise Mess and a couple areas back there. Uh, following from that, we'll be in the uh, galley. And I uh, hope everybody enjoyed today, and I look forward to seeing you again soon. Thanks. Bye.